NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. Yes, I thank you so much for joining us today um, for this webinar discussion. So we have been, um, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Monica Reed. I have the pleasure of serving as the Director of Advocacy here at the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Um, and since about last summer, we have been hosting these kind of discussions around race in the criminal legal system and really seeking to um, just highlight how race intersects with various issues in the criminal legal system. Um, navigating these racial disparities and ways to advocate for change. And so if you are interested, you can see the recordings on past webinars on our website. Um, but today's discussion is gonna focus on race and the criminal legal system as it relates to collateral consequences. And this will be part one of a discussion, a two-part discussion. Um, we are definitely excited to be able to facilitate this discussion during April, when since about 2017 has been recognized as second chance month. Um, and NACDL has been joining organizations across the country, both state, national, and local grassroots in terms of raising awareness around the obstacles that the over 70 million people with a criminal record face. Um, so definitely excited to be bringing this discussion during April. Um, today's discussion is gonna be moderated by Cynthia Roseberry. Um, she currently serves as the director, deputy director for National Policy Advocacy Department at the ACLU. But I had the pleasure of meeting Cynthia when she was at NACDL um, and she was the executive director for the historic Clemency Project 2014, um, which provided pro bono counsel to obtain the release of over 2000 individuals. Um, so we're definitely excited to have her be facilitating this conversation. Um, but before I turn over to Cynthia and she's gonna introduce the rest of the panel, I wanna go through a few housekeeping items. So one, as you can already see, we want to encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat, um, your name, your organization, where you're from, um, and be mindful if you do want um, individuals outside of the panel to see your comments, please make sure you change the two bar um, in the chat. Also, we'll be accepting questions from our audience as well. So for questions to the panel, we want you to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We apologize in advance if we can't get to all of the questions, which frequently does happen, um, but we will be sharing the panelists' uh, contact information at the close of the webinar discussion. Um, so Cynthia, I'm gonna turn it over to you to introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you, Monica. And uh, thank you to Natal for giving me the honor of moderating this panel with these you know, esteemed panelists. NACDL is always on the cutting edge of what we need to do uh, to reform our criminal justice system. I know a number, a few years ago, there was a report that NACDL put out on the collateral consequences of criminal convictions. And it was just astounding when you think about the myriad collateral consequences of convictions and even more astounding when we think about the disproportionate impact that they have on the African-American community and communities of color. Um, so let me just tell you, we've got an amazing panel here today. We have, in alphabetical order, Rob DeLeon, who is the Vice President of Programs for the Fortune Society. We've got David Singleton, who's Executive Director for the Ohio Justice Project. And we have, uh, and Policy Center, sorry, and Quinton Williams, who's the Program Officer for the Justice Reform Program at the Joyce Foundation. This is going to be a conversation I've been looking and seeing who's coming in. So it's public defenders, it's mitigation specialists, it's re-entry people, it's all the people in our community. So we're gonna have a conversation about this today. I wanna encourage you to ask questions. We're gonna have a portion of the program where you can ask questions. But uh, to start off, we have some questions uh, that we, we thought you might want to have answered. I'm gonna go in reverse alphabetical order and ask these gentlemen, a question, but gentlemen, I'd ask that first, will you tell us a little bit more about what you do about your passion, what brings you here to this topic of discussion? Mr. Williams, I'm going to start with you first. Uh, Mr. Quentin Williams, 
introduce yourself and then tell us a little bit about the long-term impacts of, you know, the permanent punishments on emerging adults that get a, a criminal record, the duration of the effect, you know, they seem to compound racially, right? So after you introduce yourself, tell us a little bit more about those permanent and compounding effects. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Cynthia, and uh, thanks to NACDL for uh, having me a part of this important uh, discussion today. Uh, my name, um, as Cynthia said, is Quentin Williams. I am program officer for the Joyce Foundation in our gun violence and justice reform, uh, gun violence prevention and justice reform uh, program. And for those that aren't familiar, the Joyce Foundation is a nonpartisan private foundation that invests in public policies and strategies to advance racial equity and economic mobility for the next generation in the Great Lakes region. So we have uh, programs uh, in our, um, at the foundation to support policy research development and advocacy. And these programs span five areas, um, in economic education and economic mobility, um, environment, democracy, culture, and gun violence prevention and justice reform. So to the question, um, you know, the, the, the idea of permanent punishments, because that's, that's the word I'm going to use, because that, that the word permanent punishment implies what usually and typically happens when someone gets a criminal record. That means they have this thing hovering over their heads um, indefinitely, oftentimes, which means for the rest of their lives. And how does this impact an individual? Well, um, this impacts where you're able to live housing restrictions. This impacts where you're able to work, um, employment restrictions, and um, the types of employment that you can pursue with licensing um, restrictions. So, and, and that's not even, that's just the tip of the iceberg. So when you talk about the long-term impacts of permanent punishment on emerging adults, and just a quick uh, note about emerging adults, we're talking about this critical age between being what we consider a juvenile and what we consider adulthood. Uh, we know now from new research that in between the ages of about 18 and 24, uh, brain development, it's, it's still happening. This is a very formative uh, time in a person's life. So this makes this issue of permanent punishments for this particular age group all the more important. Because imagine being, let's say 19 years old, and then you acquire a criminal record, you get a criminal record or you're arrested, then you have to endure, uh, in some cases, the rest of your life um, with this at that formative um, age. It's no surprise that emerging adults have some of the worst recidivism rates. It's also no surprise that a lot of our emerging adults also are oftentimes the victims of uh, gun violence themselves. So. We have an issue here where we're taking our young people and over relying on incarceration to solve problems in our communities. And what's happening is, is that we're just creating um, more racial disadvantage for generations to come um, because of these consequences or punishments. Thank you so much, Mr. Williams. I think about the introduction that Monica wrote for this project about what Michelle Alexander said about creating, you know, second class citizens and it being it being legal to discriminate against people with records. Uh, David Singleton, I know you have a national scope. Uh, I, I know also that you have a base in Ohio and you, you know, work in Ohio. Uh, we'd like for you to introduce yourself to us. It's okay if you tell us how many lives you saved because maybe you're not even counting. I don't know. But can you help us describe the breadth and scope of collateral consequences? For instance, you know, in Ohio, the number of uh, records that you have, uh, the restrictions that you have on the books. Tell us about yourself, David, and then tell us a little bit more about the breadth and scope of collateral consequences. Thank you, Cynthia, and thank you, NACDL. Um, and it really is an honor to be on this panel with such distinguished people. So. Um, just to tell you a little bit about me uh, and what fires me up, I've been uh, working as a lawyer in this beast called the criminal legal system for just about 30 years now. And I'm not going to say criminal justice system because it's not just, it is racist, it is deeply unfair, and it is dehumanizing to people. And so 
I, I started off as um, a public defender um, at a place called the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. I'm a proud alum of that office and then went on to the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia, um, proud alum of that office, and then uh, came to um, Ohio of all places so my wife could become a law professor at the University of Cincinnati. And for almost 20 years now, I have been the executive director of the Ohio Justice and Policy Center. Uh, what we do, um, just to give you the overview, is that we provide free legal representation to incarcerated people who have civil rights uh, issues in prison. We um, also have a decarceration project where we're working to free people, and it's not the Innocence Project, we're working to free people who've committed crimes but are overpunished. And then the, the, the area of work that's relevant, um, most relevant to this conversation is uh, what we call our second chance work. Um, and, and I agree with, with Quentin that that work's aimed at undoing permanent punishment because that's really what, what it is. And we represent uh, folks who come to us um, in clinics, uh, legal clinics, and what they most want is to get out from under these permanent punishments, these collateral consequences. And in the state of Ohio, just to give you a sense, we have over 1,000 laws on the books that our legislators in their wisdom have passed that restrict all kinds of opportunities to work in certain industries and fields, uh, to uh, hold professional licenses, um, and when you think about the impact that that has on people, it's not just that it denies people their um, an opportunity to to chart their own course and to to, to live in the community and, and and support themselves. It strips them of their dignity. Um, and you know the folks that we are privileged to serve have to fight to hold on to their humanity because you know when you're told you're not good enough because of some mistake you made, um, that has a lasting impact on people. It's a devastating impact. Um, so we've got over a thousand laws on the books in Ohio. You know, you could be restricted from working, um, from, from getting a barber's license if you've got a felony conviction. You might learn, one thing you might learn how to do is cut hair and it's silly to say, well, as a result of that, you know, you may not be able to get a barber's license. Um, you can't, for instance, own a construction company in the state of Ohio if you have a, a felony record. And imagine, that might be something you could do, start your own business, but the state of Ohio saying, no, can't, you know, you're forever uh, on, this, uh, on this list of, uh, of people who are not gonna get a chance. So, um, so that's just one area, um, employment um, and, uh, and also um, professional licenses. We haven't talked about, maybe we'll dive into it more later, about how folks are shot out, shut out of educational opportunities because they've got felony records. They may not be to get student loans if they've got certain uh, drug convictions, um, uh, felony convictions. And you know we haven't touched on voting. Um, that's a state by state issue. Uh, but 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 that is all of these things affect human beings. And I think that's something that that we have to. Um, to never lose sight of. We are talking about fellow human beings. All of us have made mistakes, some more serious than others, and none of us wants to be defined forever by the worst thing that we've done. Um, so so those, are my, those are my comments to that, uh, that first question. Thank you so much, uh, David, for pointing out how our system just treats people as if they are disposable. Right, as if that one wrinkle in the fabric is the entire roll or bolt, or I'm not a sewer, but maybe that was a poor analogy. But we know that we're we're more than just the one mistake we made. And as Quentin pointed out, it, especially if we it was a youthful mistake, right? Uh, we're more than that. So Rob De Leon, we're coming to you next. You do some amazing work um, across this country. 
And I know that you know, you know, how these collateral consequences um, come to a point where they, they affect people differently because of race. So I want you to speak a little bit about that. I mean, we're talking about race and collateral consequences here. And first, of course, tell us about you, what brings you here, the wonderful work you're doing, and then speak to us a little bit about the collateral consequences as they impact people differently based on race. Sure. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. Uh, thank you uh, to NACDL um, for having me here. This is a, 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 an esteemed panel of, of folks. So um, thanks for having me. Um, so I, I work at the Fortune Society where for almost 54 years now. Um, you know, our slogan has, has been building people, not prisons. And so we, 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 we work on those criminogenic factors for men and women coming home from prison. We, take a, we, we provide wraparound services to help them to re-enter society and, and to, to rejoin society in a way that's not stigmatizing. We create a community. In, in Long Island City, Queens, we have a 65,000 square feet space of, uh, of program space where you know individuals get meals and they you know they get help with everything from um, employment readiness services to health services to mental health services um, and so you know I entered this work um, 17 years ago post incarceration so I'm formally incarcerated myself um, and you know I went to prison at age 17 where I was tried and ultimately convicted as adult as an adult um, before you know the 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 age of criminal responsibility was raised in New York, so um, you know that's why this work is really personal to me, um, and you know I think it's important that as as uh, my colleagues Quentin and, and Mr. Singleton have done to talk about you know specifically what collateral consequences consequences are right which which basically um, are penalties or consequences that go beyond you know, the fines and prison and supervision, like probation and parole, you know, the things that many would consider the debt to society for a criminal conviction. So, um, you know, so many of those collateral consequences are statutory, like, like Mr. Singleton said. So people who've served their time and re-enter society in hopes of getting a fresh start, um, you know, are up against laws and rules that preclude them from getting certain jobs or from certain housing or from, from getting, getting loans. And then, you know, consequences go beyond the statutory uh, when we're talking about the biases of landlords and the biases of employers. Um, and so to answer how this impacts uh, people based on race, you know, 58% of the individuals incarcerated in the country are uh, black or Latino, um, Afro Latino, uh, or what have you, and you know, respectfully make up 13% and 18% of the American population. So there's so many of us from, from the communities that we come from that are either incarcerated, that are feeling the impacts of uh, collateral consequences, that are on some kind of uh, uh, post -su post release supervision. And, um, you know, there's a statistic that says that of every black male born today, there's a one in three chance that you will ultimately go to prison. And that's one in six for, for Latinos, um, as opposed to one in 17 for, for, uh, for white Americans. So, um, you know, I, I think that it's important to recognize just how much of our communities are being impacted by collateral consequences as a result of having been incarcerated from, you know, historically just coming from poverty or, or because of immigration. So, um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Thank you for that. Thank you for your amazing work too. So Mr. Williams, I'm gonna come back to you because, you know, when we think about collateral consequences, um, I think what we're outraged about is that people aren't being given a second chance, right? And, you know, as Mr. De Leon talked about, there are communities, right, where 
there are circumstances that create an atmosphere that people will be in prison, will have contact with the penal system. And so often that means a second chance needs to be more than a second chance. You know, I think about uh, with people who have addiction issues, for example, and you know, when a judge says, go and get clean, right? And it's, we know it's not that simple. So I wanted, wanted you to talk to us a little bit about if our thinking around this is too limited when we say second chances, right? Do we need to think about something broader than just a second chance? Um, absolutely. And it's, this is something I've been um, thinking about and, and, and saying for, for quite some time. Um, I get the connotation of second chances and I know what it implies and what it means. Um, my concern has always been, though, that it is limited in that most people that I know, both uh, uh, just most people I know, don't, no matter what their background is, no matter where they come from, you know, oftentimes have had um, a few uh, moments in their life, more than two, um, that they uh, regret or would like to take back. And Using myself as an example, I've been um, impacted by the justice system. If the logic goes where uh, a second chance is given and then that the door is shut, um, you know, I can just say I would not be here uh, talking with you all today about this critical topic. Um, I would not be on this panel. Um, I may not be uh, raising a family. I may not be a doctoral candidate. I may not be working for the Joyce Foundation if second chances is what, um, you know, is the only thing that people need. People need chances, right? Um, because I often say this as well when people ask me, well, how did you do it and how um, are you able to do this? And I would say, oftentimes, it's, 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 a, it's a strange thing, but I failed my way into success. I found ways to continue to keep going because this is the way we learn. We don't like it. It does not feel good when we're wrong. But, but let me also create some space for the fact that, that you brought this up, that our communities um, are oftentimes over-policed, under-resourced, Right. So you can give a person a second chance, let's say, give them a, a fair second chance. But if we don't deal with um, the root causes or the structural impediments that await a person when they are walking into their second chance, then that also makes the notion of second chance really untenable because it's going to be hard for individuals to live into a, a, a true second chance if we don't deal with those things that uh, my, my fellow panelists have brought up. Um, if we don't deal with that, then certainly second chance is not going to be enough. So I do think um, we do need to expand it and find some kind of language that expresses the need to bring people back in the community um, without limits. Because Frankly, I think that's what we would all want for ourselves and our loved ones. Thank you for that. that that's such a resounding message. You know, I've often said that um, when someone comes home, we need to stamp their ticket paid in full, right? Everything that was asked of you should, should, you should have a receipt for that when you come home. And I think about how the narrative reflects on the individual who failed, who was not successful at re-entry, when really it was a system that failed the individual, right? The system needs to be reformed so that people who come through it have a better chance of succeeding when they come home. And so David, as we, as we turn to you, let's talk a little bit about how we reform, you know, these sanctions and punishment. How do we change this system, I know you have some thoughts on you, a scholar, you've been studying it and writing about it. Speak to us a little bit about uh, changing. I will, and just first I wanna say this, I could not agree more, um, and this is gonna sound funny because we have a project called the Second Chance Project. I, I, I couldn't agree more with what Quentin just said and I'm now thinking we gotta change the name of that. It needs to be the Chances Clinics um, because, language does really matter. 
it matters. And, you know, our language for our project, which we've had for a long time, is well-intentioned. But, you know, we ought to not reinforce this notion because most of the clients we see have had m multiple problems and they should not be written off because they've made multiple mistakes. I just wanted to say that and I, I really appreciated the comment and it's triggered my own thinking about, about how we frame our work around that. Um, I, I think we need to be th thinking ab about getting rid of, 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 of these restrictions en masse. Um, and I know that that may seem like that's a crazy thought that's never gonna happen. But we got to think big because what society needs to do, particularly because, you know, as Quentin pointed out, and you just pointed out, Cynthia, these are system failures. These are not the fault of individuals. Sure, we, do, we are agents. You know, we, we have agency. You know, we, we do make choices. I'm not saying that, that that doesn't come into play at all. But the systems are failing. And, and you know, when we have um, graduation rates in certain public school systems that are 30%, that's a problem. And it's not the fault of a kid who goes to a school and doesn't get educated that they're going to be pushed out or drop out and become my client in the criminal legal system. And this has been going on for, on for over 400 years when it comes to Black people in this country in terms of how the systems have been set up to keep us down. So um, I, I don't think it's fair that we have these laws on the books that say you can't get a loan if you've got a criminal record. What does that have to do with whether or not you deserve a loan? That's just punitive. That's what that is. Pure and simple punishment. You know, are there some restrictions that 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 may make sense? I'm not going to say that there are none, but we've gone crazy when we have in the state of Ohio a thousand laws in the books that restrict people from working in certain industries. I think, you know, if I'm thinking big, I want to get rid of these um, en masse and 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 not have legal restrictions that get in the way of people working. Um, the other thing I would say though is. If we're going to have these kinds of laws, um, particularly around employment, they need to be limited in time. Um, and I'm not talking about 10 years. That's too long. Imagine saying to someone, come out of prison and we want you to succeed. And, you know, we're not going to let you um, work in a certain industry or field. And then maybe we'll look back in 10 years and reevaluate that. What's the person supposed to do? Um, so I think, I think that if we're going to have these kinds of restrictions, and I don't even want them, period, they need to have very, very limited amount of time for someone to, 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 to prove themselves, so to speak. I don't, I, don't think, I don't like this concept of you have to prove yourself. I mean, you're a human being. You should not have to prove your worthiness. Um, I know so many people who come out of prison because they're my clients, and they're hungry to work. And they make good employees if someone will take a chance at them. And then the last thing is that this isn't, and it's not the last thing, but it's the last thing I'm going to say right now. Um, in terms of um, these, the laws that restrict people from, from working um, and just focusing on working for a moment, it's not just a problem of laws, because even if there were no laws, you still have a problem where we have employers who don't want to hire people who have criminal records, or at least they don't want to hire Black people with criminal records, because there's studies that show that white people with criminal records will fare better in the job market than a Black person without a record. But at any rate, there is a huge problem with employers, particularly private employers, not wanting to hire people um, and, and give them an opportunity. And we've got to have leadership at all levels as our society to change that um, if we really truly want to expand opportunities for people who've made mistakes. Thank you for that, David. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to, at this point, encourage our panelists to just jump in when we're talking about these topics. This is a conversation. We're getting some questions coming in. They're fabulous questions. I'm going to get to them. Um, Michelle Rose just raised up in the chat. 
how do you have a second chance when you never had a first chance? You know, what an amazing question, when, especially when we talk about the inequities in our criminal, thank you, David, legal system. Right. And so, uh, Rob, as we turn to you, you know, David's told us, get rid of, be bold, get rid of these collateral consequences. And, and, and at least to the extent that they are arbitrary and capricious and have no bearing on, um, you know, the, the thing that the person was accused of or, or convicted of um, and their ability to come back and reintegrate. I, I'm wondering what a fair and just system looks like to you. I really appreciate and honor your lived experience in this moment. And I, so I think it's important for you to chime in. And Mr. Williams, I'm going to come back to you on this too. What would a fair and just system look like? Thank you, Cynthia. So um, first, I'm, I want to uh, agree with everything that Mr. Singleton said. And, you know, I want to just raise up for all of us here uh, a challenge, right? And, or, or a, uh, you know, a personal call to action. And that is that, um, you know, we, we, we believe in these things with our deepest, you know, hearts. And, um, you know, we want to help people. We want to advocate for them. And, and provide them with the services that help to get them back on their feet. But I think putting your money where your mouth is is really important as well. And so at Fortune, part of our mission is to hire individuals with lived experience, right? And so over 50% of our staff from line staff all the way through to the executive team, I'm the VP of programs at the organization, um, and on our board, we have uh, representation of individuals with lived experience. And so I would really, uh, uh, you know, challenge everyone to make it part of what they do to not just uh, uh, talk the talk, but to actually um, be deliberate about giving individuals that are formerly incarcerated an opportunity and, you know, with employment. Um, and, and in terms of the question, you know, I'll say that it feels as though we're light years away from, you know, a just, uh, a just system, right? Um, race, race is a social con construct. And though, you know, ideally it would dis distinguish, you know, our physical differences, um, you know, it's been used as a, as a tool of, of socioeconomic oppression, basically, or at least in this country since its inception, you know, so, you know, the question to the question to answer that question uh, would be, how do we how do we create a system that doesn't dole out punishment based on race? Right. Um, uh, you know, one that is truly equitable. You know, why do men of color not make it, you know, through their due process at the hands of police right at the very front door of the criminal justice system? Um, because they're killed for far less serious crimes than some individuals who have, uh, you know, committed very heinous crimes and are taken peacefully and, and, and you know, make it through the court system. So, uh, you know, my answer to that question is that question. How do we, how do we, you know, create a system that doesn't dole out punishment based on race? And, and I think that's the start is, is, is asking ourselves that. Well, I think that, you know, one thing is uh, narrative change um, that has to do. I think a lot of these laws are based upon ideas that about people with records that justify and legitimize these unjust laws. Um, so we need to change what it means to be a person with a record, which is simply just another human being that was caught up into a legal system that then brands you as something other than human. So that's number one. Number two, we need to have a real truthful acknowledgement about what the research is telling us that this is doing or not doing for public safety. And I could just say that we have some research to suggest that it is not netting us the public safety benefit that we think that it is. And lastly, we absolutely, it looks like changing policies. Yes, I'm with David, it looks like uh, removing uh, sort of, you know, any policy and improving practice. We have tons of programs and tons of things in different locales, being able to meet people uh, where they are and having that human framework that I mentioned about the narrative change in our practice as well, in addition to our policy. And I think that's what it would look like. 
Thank you. I see you training up some young lawyers, Mr. Williams. They are listening to you right now. I love that. I love when young people lean in. I love to hear their voices. They bring so much joy. David, you know, we have somebody who sent a question in. I hear you about to lean in on that. I want you to do that. But as you do that, I want you to think about this question from somebody who asks how to handle post disposition litigation in states where there's no second chance statute. But I know you wanted to lean in on something else first. Um, I, I, I do. Um, and can you just read that question again um, in, uh, that you want me to answer? Yeah, they're just wondering about handling uh, post disposition lit litigation where there's no second chance statute in, in, in a state, you know, where the state doesn't have anything codified that allows somebody to re enter or, you know, any program, any avenue to allow them to come back home correctly. Oh, oh okay. I, I, let me, let me, let me um, get to that. Uh, actually, let me answer that first. And I'll go, I want to go back to one point that Quentin made I wanted to lift up. And I think the answer to that is let's look for ways to make uh, creative arguments that what's really happening when we're shutting um, uh, black people out, um, you know, or, or other people of color out of employment opportunities because they have a criminal record, that that criminal record is really a proxy for racial discrimination. Um, you know, in the Obama administration, the EEOC took the position that um, that 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 denying people employment based on a criminal record could very well have a disparate impact um, in terms of race, and I think we need to be making those arguments uh, where we don't we don't have uh, um, you know other 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 ways to attack the issue. And I'm not saying that's going to be easy. Um, whenever we're trying to do progressive work in the courts, it is hard because the courts are not, by and large, progressive institutions. They are very conservative institutions. And, and, and that, that doesn't depend on who the judge is. It just depends on the nature of courts um, and precedent. And it's hard. But I think that, that, that those arguments nonetheless are worth making. Um, and if for, if for no other reason, sometimes the fight, even when you lose it, is important to take because it may plant a seed for change, but it also does something very important in terms of the, the, the people that we are privileged to represent. And that is, it says you are worth fighting for. You are worth ro you know, suiting up, rolling up the sleeves, going in the court and, 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 and going as hard as you can to try and make a difference. And that and that that is very affirming, even, even when we lose, even when we lose, we win by doing it. Um, and, and the thing I wanted to just lift up in terms of what um, what uh, Quentin said about narrative change, I, I could not agree uh, more, more with that. In fact, I think some of the most impactful work that that I've done as a lawyer, but not in my lawyer capacity, so to speak, is storytelling and finding ways to uh, to with with you know with the full partnership of 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 my clients um, to get their stories of 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 success post release out to a mainstream audience because that's necessary. Unfortunately, it shouldn't have to be, but it's necessary um, if we want to achieve systemic change. Uh, we have to, and again, I feel bad that we have to humanize human beings. It's crazy. We shouldn't have to do it, but I think we do have to do it because this this beast of a system doesn't see the humanity in the the, the people who are oppressed by the system. Doesn't see it. Writes them off. And so every person that we're, we're getting out through this project beyond guilt, our decarceration project, um, with their permission, we are, you know, they are being filmed. They are being, you know, they are, and we pay them for that. And we pay them to do photo shoots um, and to, to, to put their voices out there so that we get to start to change the narrative. It's hard work, but it's got to be done. Um, I, I absolutely believe that. Thank you, David. You know, I, I just want to thank you uh, for raising up first that you pay people, right, for, for being willing 
to open up their uh, trauma to the world uh, for the healing of others, right? And I so agree with you that it's just odd to think, I mean, even the word humanize, aren't we already human, right? Why do we have to create a narrative that tells the powers that be here before you is a human being, right? And we know, uh, we talked a little bit about how race has a disparate impact. Now, it's um, maybe clear, maybe not that, you know, I'm a woman here, they are, th this is a panel of three men, right? And so, and, and I'll admit to when I think about the criminal legal system, I think about men and I think about black men, but the truth is women are impacted tremendously by this system and women of color are tremendously impacted. So I don't wanna leave women out or any other um, sort of person that is othered by our society. And I know, Rob, you thought a lot about the overlap of race and gender you know, in the system as it uh, pertains to collateral consequences. You wanna to speak to us about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> Though, though men make up the lion's share of, of, of incarcerated people in the country, I, be, I believe the statistic is something like seven to one, a seven to one ratio of men to women. Um, the collateral consequences for women are probably more dire with women experiencing uh, the exclusions that, I, that you know, we've all mentioned uh, like housing and employment, but so many women lose their children in some scenarios, they lose them forever, you know, by being stripped of their parental rights. So, um, you know, for, for, for and, and then just think about, um, you know, having worked with women for the 17 years that I've been doing, um, you know, uh, uh, programming for formerly incarcerated persons, um, the stigma that women feel because of, you know, societal judgment on a woman who winds up being incarcerated then, you know what it is for a man it's 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 a it's a there's a disparity there you know working going into prisons um you know going into to men's prisons and women's prisons um the size of the visit floors and what it looks like on visit day and you know the difference in men and women's prisons are enormous so you know you go down on a, on a, on a, on the visit floor in a women's prison and it's probably you know the size of a small classroom and you know, some women have their mothers or their children coming to visit them, and you know, so so the 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 impacts on women could be a lot more dire even than they are for men. You know, for formerly incarcerated women trying to get their lives on track, reclaiming their families is a big part of that. So, um, you know, and and I just want to uh, touch on, you know, the point about the narrative that that you know uh, Quentin and, and David mentioned. Um, you know, I, I think it's also really important to point out, and this is uh, aside from the, the gender uh, issue, um, and that is that there's also research that individuals that have done, you know, long amounts of time are less likely to recidivate. And so, um, you know, the, the, the way that we get that narrative across, of course, is it's a sad thing that we have to humanize and we have to tell stories in order to have, you know, our formerly incarcerated brothers and sisters looked at as equals in society. But there is a lot of, a lot of research. There is a lot of data on, you know, the fact that, you know, individuals come home and can make, uh, you know, lives for themselves if they're given the opportunity. In New York, one of the exclusions is an exclusion from New York City housing. You know, so the housing projects, you're excluded from living in the housing projects. Where are you going to live? besides the shelter. So, um, you know, I, I think it's really important to, to note, um, you know, the, the, the strides that men and women can make, no matter what their backgrounds, if the right resources and opportunities are put in front of them. There's a project that we're working on um, at the Fortune Society where, you know, we talk about the lens that we look at things through, we, we you know, half empty, half full uh, cup. We always look at recidivism rates, right? And there's a research project that's gonna be going on for the next few years with, with uh, one of my colleagues, which is a desistance project. So looking at those factors and what the research is on men like myself and you know men and women like myself and others 
um, who who don't go back to prison and what those numbers look like. And I'm sure that we'll find some really interesting stories to tell out of that and some some really good numbers to be able to to, to put forward. So um, and then just just with respect to the the the, the gender issue, going back to that, um, you know, it's there's almost twice as many uh, women of color, I believe the number is 1.7 uh, of of black women to white women in in that are incarcerated. And, you know, although it's almost double, right? And some people might expect that is a much larger number. Think of how much of the population is made up of, you know, black women in this country. It's something like 13%. And so, uh, you know, that's just a, a really gross, uh, you know, uh, example of how, how disproportionate incarceration is amongst women of color. Hey. Thank you so much for lifting that up. I uh, was looking down because I wanted to pull this statistic out uh, based on what you were talking about, Mr. DeLeon, because when people go to prison, they don't go alone, their families go. And these collateral consequences impact the people who are physically in cages, but also the family members who are there in heart and mind and spirit. We know that there are about 2.7 million children of incarcerated parents in the nation. And so one of our, one of our um, questions that came up was to talk about the cyclical nature, right? Of imprisonment that collateral consequences create. And this is a question for any of you. When we think about the impact on children, when we think about collateral consequences as they impact a parent's ability to be able to care for a child, to house and feed, right? To educate a child. Um, how do these collateral consequences show up in terms of a cyclical nature, maybe, multi-generational because we know that we, uh, the child of an incarcerated parent has an increased probability of being arrested and incarcerated not only mr williams because our communities are over police but also mr singleton because the um incarceration rates are higher and the sentences are longer so do you any of you want to take the question about you know sort of this churning uh, because of collateral consequences. Don't everybody speak up at once. Uh, well, I mean, I, there's a lot we can say here, but I think let's just take the example of, of housing, right? Uh, if you have uh, the inability to secure safe and affordable housing due to a criminal record, then just think about that. Like that compounds with the, that, that impacts your ability to seek employment, um, that impacts your ability and overall well being of your entire family. Um, and there, you know, you ha so you have this, right? You, you people come out of prison or jail and they say, get a job, do better. <laughs> but you get out and say the places designed or, you know, just theoretically that are there for individuals to, quote, do better are un inaccessible to them. So if the do better, for lack of a better way of putting it, institutions or organizations or mechanisms are inaccessible to individuals who are being told to do better, then what else is left? You have the informal economy, right? And that's not only drugs, right? That's not only, uh, but that includes that though. You have the informal economy. Many of our um, uh, communities of color, many people because of the low median income because of uh, these, uh, the records and inability to access these institutions, people get involved in it from, and that then has another kind of effect. So if you're selling loose cigarettes because you can't get a job, will you be the next Eric Garner, right? right. Will, will, you, will, you get, will you get a counterfeit bill and be the next George Floyd? So yeah. that is like really good examples of how cyclical, because this, this, this could actually, be in those last two examples be matters of life and death. So that really is the cyclical nature of this is individuals coming home, being part of a system and it actually does damage long term. Yeah, that breaks my heart to think about David. Yeah, um, and it breaks my heart too. And, and I think that part of the problem is that we do not think through the consequences of of, uh, of, of these systems that we have built up to oppress people. We don't think through it. 
Um, and, and well, well, actually, let me say it this way. We have to a certain extent, because I do think that the system is, is, is operating the way it's designed to operate. But, you know, I talked to a lot of legislators who say, well, you know, it just makes sense to keep someone, you, you know, out of working, uh, you know, in a, you know, with children or with the elderly, if they've got this kind of conviction and they don't think through, I don't think, what is going to happen if people who are coming home aren't able to work? Um, so I do think that this churning is is something that um, is important for for everybody to understand. I do want us to say one point, if I can, because I I, I noticed a comment um, in the chat about perhaps we should be focusing more on social and economic impacts of all of this rather than race and. You know, let me say say this as someone who whose office represents a number of, of, of white folks who are shut out of these opportunities um, as well because of a criminal record, and we fight just as hard for them as we fight for for black and brown people. But but here's the deal: this system is set up primarily to oppress black people. It's been going on for 400 plus years. And we are the canaries in the coal mine. If we can get rid of these restrictions that I think are very much a part of the awful racial legacy of this country, everyone benefits, not just black people, but, but, but my white clients as well. Um, so I think we do need to dig into the race issue. It may not be a comfortable conversation to have, but it's absolutely a thousand percent um, a conversation that we must have. Thanks for that, David. I, I, I agree with you. I think there's a combination, right? I think when we look at the criminal legal system in isolation, then we don't see the whole scope because it really is poorly funded schools. It really is improper health care or no prenatal care and Right, it, it, it's a combination of things and the criminal legal system is sort of in the middle of it with these tentacles going out. You know, when I did death penalty cases in Chicago, the first thing I needed to know was whether the client grew up in Cabrini Green because I knew there was led a chance of executive functioning that was disrupted because of lead poisoning in the paint in that housing project, right? So that's a decision that, you know, didn't even have an involvement with, with the criminal justice system. You know, it was a housing, it was, right? So all of these things combine to create this monstrous criminal legal system. And it's, it's how we find ourselves here. Rob, I don't know if you have some sure. thoughts about uh, that single yeah. nature or anything else. Yeah, one thing I just wanna say is that um, you know, I think that telling narratives and, 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 you know, attempting to, to change the minds of, of individuals, um, is something that we wind up finding as a brick wall, right? I have a colleague who, who, who once said, we need to really like get laws on the books to change things because, you know, um, folks aren't changing their minds and their hearts. So laws around employment laws around housing really have to change. 50% of what we do, I, I failed to mention, at Fortune is we do advocacy. So we do policy advocacy at the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy named after our founder. Um, you know, we, we, we have some laws that seem to be taking us, you know, some bit of a way, right? Like 23A in New York, which is about banning the box that asks the question about whether or not you have a criminal conviction. And, you know, that hasn't really come as far as we think it could, right? There's so many peripheral ways of finding out whether or not someone has a criminal conviction before offering them a job. Um, raising the age of, of, of criminal responsibility from 16 to 18 is something that I was a, a, a staunch advocate of. Um, again, didn't get, you know, all of us, the advocacy community wasn't very happy with it because you know some 16 and 17 year olds are remaining in the criminal justice in the adult criminal system um and so you know i really think that we need to work hard on what um laws are on the books 
to really change, uh, you know, things from, you know, how individuals are excluded from employment, from housing, et cetera. And, um, you know, this, I think, is a great start, a group of advocates uh, in the same room. Yeah, um, I think uh, you make a good point about um, beginning to change, you know, looking at uh, these laws. And I know Alinda Moy, my, my good friend from Howard University, uh, talked here about how these collateral consequences, um, and David, you, you talked about this a little bit, really don't make sense, right? And how can we begin to look at whether the collateral consequences, you know, are necessary where they, they achieve a desirable goal if they are too numerous or too onerous in nature, right? Well, you know, I, I can recall, and I won't mention the state, but there was a state that said that if you had a conviction, you couldn't get a fishing license. Now, maybe I don't know enough about fishing, you know, I, 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 granted, I've only been fishing a couple of times, but I can't imagine how a fishing license, unless it's some big commercial venture and it's a fraud or something like that. I just can't imagine how, how someone thought that a fishing license was, was something that needed to be a part of the gauntlet of collateral consequences for people who are returning home. And, you know, I've just seen some that are just so outrageous, not connected at all to the thing for which the person was convicted or accused and just serving as an impediment. When you talked about do better, right? You know, and they say, well, get a job, just go to McDonald's. Well, I remember in the clemency project how people had to have been incarcerated 10 years, which means in that time, technology had changed. So to get a job at McDonald's, you had to use an iPad, right? And people didn't know about the Bluetooth and the, the you know, the earpieces and that sort of, and so it was like dropping someone into an alien country. And then when you add on top of this, just arbitrary things that you cannot do, like you cannot associate with someone else with a conviction. So should you ask everybody you meet, wait before man, you know, wait, wait lady, before I talk to you, you know, what's your, what's your criminal history? I mean, it's just insane. I don't know if you guys have anything to say about how the, the, the numerous and onerous collateral consequences seem so disconnected from any desirable government goal. Well, well, that example that you just gave, Cynthia, if I could just jump in, is, you know, it's like akin to saying, you shouldn't be able to pass out water to somebody in a long voting line in Georgia that you created because you're trying to uh, keep black people from voting. I mean, that's just great. It's, it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any damn sense. Um, it doesn't. Uh, but, but here's what I'd say. I, 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 I would also say that even where there may be a closer connection between the crime of conviction and the job that is taken away from this person. I think we need to be careful not to, and I'm not suggesting you're thinking this way, but, but I, I, there are lots of people who would say, I have no problem with someone who's committed a serious crime, um, a violent crime from being excluded from this job or that job. And we throw people under the bus when we take that approach. And it, it, it drives me nuts when we're thinking about who should be getting out of prison. And, you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about how people who commit low level nonviolent crimes need to be getting out. And I agree, but that doesn't mean that people who've committed more serious crimes need to be locked up. And I'd say the same thing with regard to collateral consequences. Let's be careful, um, all of us, all of us, in terms of not throwing people under the bus um, by, by because I, I would agree, the person who like wants to get the fishing license, that's just insane that they can't get the fishing license. I don't care what they did. But, you know, what about somebody who's, you know, committed a homicide and they want to work um, around children? Why should we say that that's off limits um, necessarily. We should not say that as, you know, as a matter of the conviction. I just don't think we should. And as, as Rob pointed out, um, or I think it was Rob pointed out, the, you know, folks who are the least likely to reoffend 
are some of the longest serving um, incarcerated people who've committed really violent crimes. Um, so I, that's, that's the point I wanted to make on that. Thank you for raising that, you know, and, and Rob, I'll come to you next, but I, I just want to lift up how easy it is to be convicted of a violent crime, right? Especially in the federal system, which is what I know, you know, the conspiracy charge uh, can have you, despite the fact that you're millions of miles away, responsible for a violent crime that someone else committed, right? Or uh, if we know that there are charging differences, there's disparity in charging, snatching a purse in one instance is a theft, but in the other instance is an assault or an aggravated assault, right? And it's a violent crime for one kind of person, but not a violent crime for a different kind of person. Right. And so there we know there's disparity. And so this violent nonviolent dichotomy is really a false distinction because we really don't define violence in terms of physical harm uh, that's that's committed by the individual who's deemed to have been violent. Right. So, Rob, I want you know, want you to chime in a little bit on that, if you will. Sure. Um, someone mentioned earlier that I wasn't speaking loud enough. I hope uh, you guys can hear me. So. Um, you know, when I when I do this kind of advocacy about, you know, why we should we should, you know, we should reform our criminal legal system. Um, sometimes I tailor my, you know, what I'm saying to my audience, right? And, you know, when I'm tailoring it to an audience that isn't so much about the human part of it, I point to the fiscal implications, right? And the 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 public safety implications. So, you know, for instance, in New York, which we're, we're working to close Rikers Island because of the historic, you know, uh, just violence and corruption that this place represents and racism. Um, and, you know, in monitoring the, the, the population as it goes up and down, you know, one of the things that we um, notice is that parole violators are a growing population, technical parole violators. So if someone is struggling with addiction, you know, we criminalize that. We will put someone back in prison. The collateral consequence is that they're on, you know, release supervision. And so they're at risk for having an addiction issue for going back to prison, whereas someone who isn't on parole, you know, has to you know, has the leisure of looking for treatment services or whatever their family's trying to, to tend to them. And so um, fiscally, right, it costs upwards of $300,000 to house someone on Rikers Island annually. And it costs like 40000 or less per year to serve an individual like that. I think it's way less than that, actually. I think it's more like 20,000 uh, per year um, per person to serve someone in the community. Now, where public safety is, is, is involved, we have better outcomes when we provide services to individuals, right? We have better outcomes in terms of whether or not they recidivate than if you just put them in prison without introducing them to those services. And so where public safety is concerned, this person is less likely to commit another crime and go back you know, to prison and maybe there'd be another you know, crime victim or whatever the case is. And so I, I'm always trying to lift up those points as well. I'm personally in it because you know, this is something that's, you know, that's impacted me, that's impacted my family, a number of generations of my family. But uh, the truth is there are some very, you know, logical other reasons why it's so important to, to, to you know, put reforms in place. You know, I remember, thank you for that, Rob, uh, being a member of the Colson Task Force on Federal Corrections. And we had a hearing with the Bureau of Prisons um, officials and I asked the head of the mental health unit how are you measuring the impact of incarceration on people? And the question is, we are not, right? And so I think about 
collateral consequences that flow from a system that just says you have to be taken out of society. That's it. We're not measuring what that does to you or for you or for society. You just have to be removed from society. And so collateral consequences show up in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, in one way with me, with someone who would come home, who was working with me, who was late every day. And I kept getting on the person, you gotta be on time, you gotta on time. And finally the person said, listen, I can't get on that crowded train in the morning. I can't do it. And so we just needed to adjust the work schedule to make sure the person was okay to come to work, right? So collateral consequences show up in a lot of different ways. They're not necessarily always codified. They're not necessarily always conditions of release. They show up in myriad ways that only someone who's trod that path can understand and know. So I'm, I'm asking about opening that up, Quentin. If you know about you know, sort of opening up, going beyond, you know, sort of this box of what, at least I, I'll own it, generally think of as collateral consequences. Oh, man. Well, you you just opened up uh, quite a bit there. I think there's a, a, a number of consequences that I would, and without sounding self-promoting, I did write an article with a, with a colleague of mine, and it was called... Um, um, redemption and rehabilitation on the outside, the burden of post-incarceration life. And in that paper, we developed this idea of burden, not barrier, right? Because there is an assumption, right, that there are tons of barriers. And, and, I, and I'm getting at what you're, what you're describing here. There are barriers that are on the books, right? There are laws and statutory regulations, administrative regulations, and those can can be considered barriers but in our approach historically what what that it carries with it an assumption that if you remove said barriers all will be well well we looked at that and um and both in in both of our data we show that even in in, in like i mean they are checking all the boxes the individuals that uh, we lift up in our study, um, and thank you for dropping it in the chat. By all objective measures, working, uh, volunteering, um, often incessantly, right, trying to prove something. But what we found is that they're still met with judgment, right? You can't really measure that, right? Like, how do you measure judgment? We try to measure it in our paper. Uh, judgment, competing demands. Um, parole officer wants you to come over here. Job says you better not be late over here. Child care provider says I can't do it today. Right. Um, so, so those are just a couple of examples of this. This goes well beyond um, barriers or laws on the books again, which is why earlier I alluded to um, us. The, the, the reason why I invoke the humanness uh, to which we all agree, I think, on this panel, it's absurd to even have to do. But I think the reason why I do that is because I think sort of at the core of our issue, that's what it is, is how we treat, how we treat each other. Even if a person is, I know people who, who, who are, are scholars and who have done everything to quote atone for everything they've done, yet they still run the risk of a uh, bit, like it, it's, it's, it's no guarantee that your redemption, your public display of redemption at least, will be granted by whoever the power holder is in a particular moment or any given moment. So I think that's, a, that's why it's important, even, it, you know, that's why I talk about prosecutors a lot. This is important. Prosecutors have an insane amount of discretion um, to, to do different things as it relates to how we deal with, quote, crime. Prosecutors, judges, law enforcement, the trifecta, right? You have the, the enforcers, law enforcement on the front end over policing. You have prosecutors putting the hammer down, except for those reform-minded prosecutors that are trying to do things different. But what happens is when they try to do something different, then they end up getting criticized by law enforcement, right? Um, so, so anyway, I say all of that to say is that, yes, you're absolutely right. We, we ought to look beyond uh, the legality of this. 
Um, in fact, we need to, um, and in order to, to, to achieve the, the long-term goals that we have. So David, I know Rob touched on technical violations, right? And, and you've touched on this idea about humanizing. And, and now Quentin has kind of taken us beyond what we normally think about as collateral consequences. And I, I think about those three subjects combined and I think about how um, that individual that's assigned to the person, that parole officer, that supervising officer has tremendous power and can change the life of a person. That in and of itself is a collateral co consequence so that if you are late for an appointment, right? You are at risk of going back to prison. If you have an argument with your significant other, you are at risk of going. I mean, there are so many collateral consequences that are beyond the, 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 the scope of, of the four pages, right, of, of statute. But the consequences are, are more dire because you, you get violated. Now you are a re- Fender, if they want to put labels on human beings. And, and the humanity in that is lost. So the more that happens, the less I think the system recognizes the humanity of it. Because if we were talking about humanity, the humane system would allow for the fact that somebody is in a poor neighborhood on a public transportation route that might not get them to their probation office on time. Right. Or that there, there may be some issues at home in the family from which the person was incarcerated and to which the person returns upon release. And so all of those are kind of, you know, beyond the scope of what we normally see, but a part of the need, not just to humanize the person, but to humanize that system, right, to make that system understand how it operates on people. I don't know if you want to speak on that a little bit. I think you touch on something, Cynthia, that is um, that that is that is fundamentally important to try and do, and so hard to accomplish. I mean, our criminal legal system processes people. It processes people on the front end. It processes people in the middle passage of it when they're incarcerated, and it processes people on the way out. And I, I think I, I think that the the, the system um, just chews up people and doesn't even see them as human. So I I I I agree with that. I think even where even where we have well intentioned parole officers, and and I know some, and I've had some that have supervised uh, people that that I represent. And even, even with the well-intentioned parole officer who tries to help and doesn't violate the person if they make a mistake or two or three, it's still an inhumane system because hanging over that person is the threat that they're gonna go back to prison. If they if they slip up in some way, and that's just no way to live life. I couldn't imagine, and and I I'm fortunate. I I have not been incarcerated, and I should say yet. I mean, I I hope that never happens to me. Um, I could not imagine living with looking over my shoulder at the government on a daily basis, wondering when they may be coming for me if I make a mistake, if I oversleep and don't make an appointment, or if I make the choice, I'm not going to go to my, my parole officer meeting today because I've got to put food on the table and I can't lose this job. That's inhumane to put people to those choices. Um, how you change that, I don't know because I think I, I think that that, that frankly um, just, we we've got to like raise raise the system to the ground and 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 because it, it's it's built on a foundation of oppression. I don't know how you change that by nibbling at the edges. I just don't. 
Yeah, uh, thank you for Dave, uh, for that, David. I know that most probation and parole officers are badge carrying law enforcement officers. And as we're looking at policing across the nation, we look at alternatives to police in circumstances. So I wonder what it looks like to have a social worker, right, supervise a person or, or uh, some kind of mental health professional or some other professional, like a reentry professional. A lot of people have talked about that in the chat, right? Uh, somebody other than the person who can got you, the person who can send you back to prison. I wonder what that looks like. Yeah, I, can I just say, I think that's a good idea. And I, the only thing I would say is th that what you have to take off the table, just take it off the table, is you go back to prison if you, if you, met, if you have a, what, what's called a technical parole violation. Just take that off the table because it, it could be a, if you have a social worker who is reporting to the parole board and saying, well, this person missed an appointment, they get, you know, and then they're, they're going to go back to prison because of that. You can change the, you know, you can have a, a, a softer, more gentle person who is providing the service, but if ultimately the end result of, me of messing up, um, even if you want to call it messing up as you go back to prison, that doesn't change it. But, you know, take that off the table. You don't go back to prison for technical violations. Period. I'm, I'm going to, Come, come to you next. I know we're coming up on our last quarter of an hour, and I want to make sure I make space for each of you to have, you know, your last word in this moment and have as much time as you want. Uh, but before we do that, Rob, I don't know if you want to talk about um, this idea of reform by taking, you know, the the risk of going back to prison off the table by by inserting someone other than a law enforcement type into that part of the process so that's not one of the consequences sure and you mean at the on the on the back end right uh, parole and probation um you know i'll i'll say of course that i agree um with the idea of removing technical parole uh violations as an option um there's a there's a legislative push in new york uh called uh, um less is more which looks to do exactly that. It looks to, to um, you know, it looks to limit the powers because they're very, they're very um, arbitrary, those powers. And they're very selective in that one parole officer can decide that if, you know, you produce a positive toxicology or if you were home late for curfew or whatever it is, that you're, you know, going back to prison while the other can decide, no, I'm, you know, that I'm not going to violate you. So that's very, very, uh, that's, that's too, um, you know, subjective. And so I agree with the, I, with the notion of, of, um, you know, removing that as an option. Um, and, you know, also with individuals who are trained to, to, to work with, with humans and to help to, to, to figure out, you know, what the better outcome is. And, 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 you know, I don't want to demonize, uh, you know, parole and probation officers. I feel like I'm talking to the right crowd, no matter what, but, um, you know, I, I don't want to do that. Right. Because in, in all fairness, um, and the last time we had this conversation, I was on a panel about less is more. And I had a bunch of parole officers. there. We, 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 uh, you know, we had some words, but, but, um, but, you know, the fact is that I think that kind of training, right, where, you know, removing this whole law enforcement approach to, um, you know, if someone commits a crime, whatever, like, traditionally, that's the, that's the, the job of the police, how we do policing, of course, is something that's, that's in question, uh, you know, with, with the advocacy world, but um, you know, for the person who's doing post-release supervision, I believe that their job should be to, to prevent you from, you know, reoffending, from going back to prison. And so technical violations should come off the board, but the whole idea of, of you know, law enforcement and, and, and um, you know, th this punitive connotation to, to, to post-supervision uh, folks, officers, you know, as it stands right now should be removed. And, and um, so I agree with David, basically. 
Thank you for that. And thank you for that reminder. I certainly wasn't trying to label any particular group. You know, I'm just suggesting that the type of professional, the type of training necessary in that space may be something different than a law enforcement type training or space. So we're coming up on our, our, our last comments. The, this is the best part of this discussion because this is when these geniuses are gonna give you these last little pearls dripping from their lips of what you can take away uh, from this discussion. Uh, we're gonna start, we'll, st we'll continue to move in reverse alphabetical order. Start with you, Mr. Williams. Give us your last pearls to take away. Well, first of all, thank you for being such an amazing moderator throwing these very nice bounce passes and alley-oops. I appreciate you for that. Um, I have three things that I wanna leave with the, the people today. One is that uh, with all the talk about, uh, you know, um, abolition and getting rid of the penal system, I would like to submit to people that I would like to abolish the prison after the prison. So there is another invisible prison that we need to dismantle. We've talked about that today and hope you would give some consideration to getting rid of that invisible prison, the one that you can't see oftentimes. And if you want to know just how deep um, and, 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 and uh, this, this problem goes, I will point you to a report that was done by Heartland Alliance. Uh, it's called Never Fully Free. Never Fully Free. Um, check that out. Um, that's number one. Number two, we need to uh, pay attention to our emerging adults, our 18 to 24. Or you look at any measure, um, the, the leading cause of death for black males under 25 is homicide, gun violence. Um, the, the recidivism rates for these 18 to 24 year olds are abysmal. Um, this is just a group that is often on the margin margin. So they're not just on the margin, they're disconnected from services. They're very um, at high risk to be uh, um, victims and or uh, potentially uh, an actors of violence. So we need to really look at this group um, and, and, and see what it is that they need. Um, and lastly, I would encourage us to uh, think about uh, prosecutors and their extreme uh, discretion that they have oftentimes and think about police and police, think about it. And I, I don't mean just think about it, like think about what's going on in the world because we all know what's going on. We all see the videos constantly every so many months. But really, we've, we've never done anything else to try to achieve public safety. Never. If we have, let me know. But we haven't done anything. We've tried to incarcerate. We've tried to arrest. We've tried to mandatory minimum. We've tried to life in prison. We have tried all of these different things. And I say we because we're all part of this. As much as we want to distance ourselves from it, we are part of it. Until it's gone, we're all responsible. So with that said, um, we need to do the hard work of reimagining what public safety or what shared safety is going to look like. What, is it, what are going to be the mechanisms? What is the actual material structure? What is the infrastructure? Um, and, and we really need to think about that with all stakeholders involved um, because we've never done anything else. So we got a lot of work to do. And thank you all for having me today. Thank you so much uh, for that. Thank you for your thoughtfulness around these topics. We really appreciate you. Um, David, you want to weigh in here with your pearls? I do. Uh, I don't know that I'd call them pearls, but I will weigh in. And the first thing I want to say relates to my co-panelists. And I think it's fitting that I went in the middle. Um, as a trial lawyer, we are taught that we want to include our most important, important points first and last. There's something called primacy and recency. And it's fitting that I'm in the middle because I think it is critical that people with lived experience are the ones um, driving this conversation. Uh, sure, I've got things I can say, I've got experience like representing people in the system and fighting fighting the system, but people who've actually lived it and have um, been in, in incarcerated and, have, and and have struggled with collateral consequences, they need to be out front. We need to be centering their voices 
in this advocacy. So I'm glad I went in the middle. Um, and I think it's important that we always remember um, who, whose voices we really need to elevate in this conversation. The, the, the other point that I, I wanna make, and, and it's why I do this work, um, it's about the humanity of people. It is about the humanity of folks who are getting squashed on a daily basis by an oppressive, racist, and unjust system. I do agree with, with what Rob had to say about sometimes, you know, that argument is not going to move policymakers, but I think that, that, that that's got to at least animate the passion um, that drives us to find solutions um, for this, 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 this terrible system. And I just want to close with just one particular client that comes to mind who really struggled with all of the things that were off limits to her because of her um, criminal conviction. She couldn't live in public housing. Um, she, she couldn't get a job that paid a living wage. And on a daily basis, her humanity was being stripped away from her. But it wasn't just her. It was also her five children who were suffering as well. And so I don't remember who said it. I think it may have been Cynthia, but this impacts not just people who are convicted of crimes, but their loved ones as well. And it impacts the whole community because if, if, if we keep churning people um, in and out of prison, limiting their opportunities when they come home and saying, we expect you to succeed. And then at the same time, we're, we're, we're holding them back. Then we are all going to pay the price. We're all going to pay the price because we're not going to have as vibrant a community as we should have. We are all going to pay the price to the extent that there is um, a re, you know, a revolving door, so to speak, in, in crime because people are desperate and they got to live somehow. And we all pay the price and we all need to remember that, um, that it's in our interest to, to abolish the prison after a prison. Thank you so much for that, David. Thank you. Uh, and Rob, we come to you now for your sure. pearls. I wish uh, I, I would have gone, gone first in this one. Uh, because of the jewels of my, my fellow panelists, they're, they're just really heavy and I appreciate them. Um, so, you know, I think I might have uh, prematurely dropped one of my, my final thoughts. I'll just repeat it. And that is, of course, a, a, you know, a call to action to everyone here to not just, um, you know, not just to, to, to talk about, you know, the, the opportunities that folks deserve, right? And just send them out to find those opportunities elsewhere. I think that we need to hire individuals right within our own, you know, uh, places of employment. And it's something that, you know, again, we do as a practice, at the, as a deliberate practice at the Fortune Society. And, you know, um, you know, do we worry about, is that a discriminatory practice, like a reverse discriminatory practice to say you should have, you know, a lived experience with having been incarcerated? Um, I think that what we should do is maybe take down some of the barriers that exists to helping individuals with lived experience uh, to become in, in, employed. You know, some of those things might include whatever the credentials are that are required for certain jobs or whether or not you have jobs that exist that don't require like such, uh, uh, um, you know, high credentials or whatever it is. That's not to say that there aren't, you know, formerly incarcerated men and women. Think of the numbers that we threw around so many of us are walking around today, um, you know, doing the work that we do, be it advocacy work or something else that doesn't necessarily tokenize our formerly incarcerated status, you know, so from, you know, construction workers where it's allowed or, or barbers where it's allowed or anything else. So, um, you know, I, I would really, um, 
you know, I would really stress to everyone that it's important to, to not just talk about what people deserve, but to be actively part of, um, you know, creating those opportunities. Um, you know, I agree with, 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 uh, with, with Quentin wholeheartedly about reimagining um, our system and the fact that what we've been doing for so long um, just, you know, hasn't been working for everyone. Let, let's say that. Um, it probably works for some, but it hasn't been working for everyone uh, necessarily where I come from. Um, you know, the, the uh, I struggle with not demonizing people sometimes, but, um, you know, the police department was, policing was created to protect, uh, you know, uh, the interests of slave owners in the South, right? And, 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 and businesses in the North. And, you know, it's victimized, you know, people that look like me, that look like the panelists um, for, for so many years. So we need to do more. Like I imagine some like federal council on criminal justice um, that, that really is a think tank on how we could do things different. And I think this is a ripe time to, to, to attempt to put something like that in, in place. Um, because, you know, on a local level, in some places we're trying things and others, um, you know, we're not interested. So um, I really think that we need to do everything we can to reimagine criminal justice across the country. And um, yeah, I, I really thank everyone for having me here today. Um, you know, one, one thing that I won't leave out is, I didn't speak on a little earlier, when, when we spoke about what are the other collateral consequences, not necessarily the ones that, you know, are statutory that we see in our faces. And, you know, they include individuals coming home and attempting to rebuild their families, men and women, and those struggles and what they really entail. Some of us went away with newborns and, and returned to, to teens. And there's that struggle of rebuilding that bond, right? That you have to deal with at home before you go to work every day. Um, there's some of us who are just um, dealing with, you know, imposter syndrome. Like, is someone going to turn around one day and say, wait a minute, you don't belong here. You, mm -hmm. you know, you, you come from over there, from that place. Um, even coming on this panel, you know, sometimes, you know, someone like me who's been doing this work for 17 years, um, you still have that in the back of your head. And so, um, you know, th those are some of the things to keep in mind, I think, when, uh, you know, when we're dealing with individuals with lived experience and just helping to reintegrate them into society. And thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, Rob. Thank you for that. Thank you to this panel. We honor your experiences that are lived experiences and the hard work that you've done. NACDOL is just a part of this great and tremendous work trying to change the way our system operates. Um, I'm Cynthia Roseberry. Thank you so much. Monica Reed is going to tell you how to listen in the next time and what how you can do more to help. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And thank you to each of the panelists, Rob, Quentin, and David. It's just um, engaging conversation and so enlightening and to hope that everyone is, as I did, I feel like I always learn when I even, you know, coming from this work, I still continue to learn more and more. So definitely thank you for just sharing your expertise, each of you um, for this panel. Um, like Cynthia mentioned, and we'll also put up a slide where you can um, give some feedback in terms of this uh, panel discussion and also for future ones. So um, definitely fill it out. You'll, the survey has been dropped in the chat as well. Um, and let us know your thoughts. We're always looking to improve and for other suggestions and topics as we continue in this conversation on race in the criminal legal system. Um, and as we alluded to at the beginning and Cynthia as well, there is a part to this conversation um, while we're still in April. And so on April 27th, um, at the same time, 4 p.m. Eastern, we'll have kind of a part two on a race and criminal legal system and focusing on collateral consequences. Um, so that registration information will be soon to come. If you registered for this event, you'll definitely um, be on the invite list to get that once it's available. Um, but again, thank you so much. And thank you for everyone for sticking, sticking with us throughout this conversation. Um, and we look forward to that part two in two weeks. <laughs>